Maharaj have done to come to our Zoom uh, classes. Thank you, Maharaj, for everything. So we hope to see you again and again uh, for the following classes and all that. So Maharaj, maybe Maharaj can continue with the class. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Okay. Om um, um. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya 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 so today we're going to read from the Bhagavad Gita as it is, chapter 5, which is Karma Yoga, Action in Krishna Consciousness. And we're going to read the final verse of the chapter, text number 29. Bhoktaram yagna tapasam Sarvaloka Maheshwaram Sarvaloka Maheshwaram Suridam Sarvabhutanam Suridam Sarvabhutanam Gyadvamam Shantim Richati Gyadvamam Shantim Richati Bhuktaram Yagna Tapasam Sarva Loka Maheshwaram Sarva Loka Maheshwaram Suridam Sarva Bhutanam Suridam Sarva Bhutanam Gyadvamam Shantim Richati Gyadvamam Shantim Richati Bhoktaram Yagna Tapasam Bhoktaram Yagna Tapasam Sarva Loka Maheshwaram Sarva Loka Maheshwaram Suridam Sarva Bhutanam Suridam Sarva Bhutanam Gyadvamam Shantim Richati Gyadvamam Shantim Richati What meaning? Bhoktaram, the beneficiary Yagna of sacrifices Tapasam and penances and austerities. Sarvaloka of all planets and the demigods thereof. Maha Ishwaram, the Supreme Lord. Suridam, the benefactor. Sarva of all. Bhutanam the living entities, Gyatva, thus knowing, Mam, me, Lord Krishna, Shantim, relief from material pangs, rich ati, one achieves. Translation and purport by His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Srila Prabhupada. First translation. A person in full consciousness of me, knowing me to be the ultimate beneficiary of all sacrifices and austerities, the Supreme Lord of all planets and demigods, and the benefactor and well-wisher of all living entities attains peace from the pangs of material miseries. Purport. The conditioned souls within the clutches of the illusory energy are all envious, are all anxious to attain peace in the material world. But they do not know the formula for peace, which is explained in this part 
of the Bhagavad Gita. The greatest peace formula is simply this. Lord Krishna is a beneficiary in all human activities. Man should offer everything to the transcendental service of the Lord because he is the proprietor of all planets and the demigods therein, thereon. No one is greater than he. He is greater than the greatest of the demigods, Lord Shiva and Lord Brahma. In the Vedas, Svetashvatara Upanishad 6, 7, the Supreme Lord is described as Tam Ishwaram Paramam Maheshwaram Under the spell of illusion, living entities are trying to be lords of all they survey, but actually they are dominated by the material energy of the Lord. The Lord is the master of material nature and the conditioned souls are under the stringent rules of material nature. Unless one understands these bare facts, it is not possible to achieve peace in the world, either individually or collectively. This is the sense of Krishna consciousness. Lord Krishna is the supreme predominator and the living entities, including the great demigods, are his subordinates. One can attain perfect peace only in a complete Krishna consciousness. This fifth chapter is a practical explanation of Krishna Consciousness, generally known as Karma Yoga. The question of mental speculation as to how Karma Yoga can give liberation is answered herewith. To work in Krishna Consciousness is to work with the complete knowledge of the Lord as the predominator. Such work is not different from transcendental knowledge. Direct Krishna consciousness is bhakti yoga and jnana yoga is a path leading to bhakti yoga. Krishna consciousness means to work in full knowledge of one's relationship with the Supreme Absolute. And the perfection of this consciousness is full knowledge of Krishna, or the Supreme Personality of Godhead. A pure soul is the eternal servant of God, and his fragmental part and partial, he comes
which helps one control the senses in every respect and conquer the influence of desire and anger. And one who stands fast in Krishna consciousness, controlling the above-mentioned passions, remains factually in the transcendental stage or Brahma Nirvana. The Eightfold Yoga Mysticism is automatically practiced in Krishna Consciousness because the ultimate purpose is served. There is a gradual progress of elevation in the practice of Yam, Niyam, Asan, Pranayam, Pratyahara, Dharana, Dhyana and Samadhi. But these only preface perf perfection by devotional service, which alone can award peace to the human being. It is the highest perfection of life. Thus ends the Bhaktivedanta purports to the fifth chapter of the Srimad Bhagavad Gita in the matter of Karma Yoga, action in Krishna consciousness. Om Magyana Timarandasya Gyananjana Shalakaya Chaksurun Militanyena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Shri Chaitanya Mano Bistam Stapitam Yena Bhutale Swayam Rupa Kadamayam Dadati Swapadante Kam Bandeham Shri Guru Shri Yatapada Kamalam Shri Gurun Vaishnavamscha Shri Rupam Sakrajatam Sahagana Raganatan Vitam Tam Sajevam Sadvaitam Savadutam Parijana Sahitam Krishna Chaitanya Devam Shri Radha Krishna Padan Sahagana Lalita Shri Vishakanitamscha Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Pristaya Bhutale Shri Mati Bhakti Vedanta Swaminiti Namane Namaste Sarasati Devi Kauravani Precharine Nirvisesha Shunyavadi Paschacha Desatarine Vanchakalpa Terubhyascha Kripa Sindhu Bhayevacha Patitanam Pavanebhyo Vaishnavibhyo Namo Namaha He Krishna Karana Sindhu Dina Bandhu Jagatpate Gopesha Gopika Kanta Radha Kanta Namastate Tapta Kanchana Gorange Radhe Vrindavaneshwari Vrishabhanu Sute Devi Pranamami Hari Priye Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Atvaita Gadadhar Shri Vasade Gaur Bhaktavinda Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Translation again. A person in full consciousness of me, knowing me to be the ultimate beneficiary of all sacrifices and austerities, the Supreme Lord of all planets and demigods and the benefactor and well-wisher of all living entities attains peace from the pangs of material miseries. So generally we speak of this verse as being the peace formula. It's a formula here within this verse. You can see there are three uh, points mentioned in this formula, three uh, items which we have to apply in order to get the result. And the result is mentioned peace, shantim, reach a tea, right? 
Bhuktaram Yagna Tapasam Sarva Loka Maheshwaram Suridam Sarva Bhutam Nam Gyadva Mam Shanti Mrichati. So Shanti meaning relief from material pangs. Probably translated in that way, the word meaning. Generally we think of Shanti as simply peace. And everyone has a strong desire for peace. We enjoy peace. We campaign for peace. Sometimes uh, we will pr protest. We want peace. Ban the bomb. We want peace. Give us peace. And we're very eager for peace. And we offer prayers to get peace. But we enjoy a peaceful life. Anyway, it's... I mentioned here how to actually get real peace, not just, not just the temporary illusion of peace. So there are three points mentioned here in order to achieve peace. First of all, that we should understand that Lord Krishna is the purpose of all of our penances and austerities. Bhoktaram and yagna and tapasam. All of our yagnas and tapasas, tapasas, the, the, the dependencies and sacrifices which we perform, they're all done, they should all be done for the satisfaction, for the pleasure of Lord Krishna. That's very important. We say yagna vai Vishnu. We do yagna for the pleasure of Lord Vishnu, who is non-different from Lord Krishna. And similarly, when we do tapasya, when we perform some kind of austerities, we should do it for the pleasure of the Supreme Lord also. We, sh we should want to please Him. So yagna and tapasya are meant for the pleasure of the Supreme Lord. And then, Sarva Loka Maheshwaram, that that one Supreme Lord is the proprietor of everything. He's the proprietor of all the planets, not just simply this one planet, but all the planets, all the whole creation is actually His. So He is Maheshwara, He is the great controller. Or He's the proprietor of everything. And then the third point in the peace formula, Suridam Sarva Bhutanam, that he's the best friend of all living entities. And so Krishna uses very special terms here, Suridam Sarva Bhutanam that he's a very, very special friend. There are many different words to talk about friends or acquaintances. We talk about dosht or mitra, like that. There's different ways in which we would talk about our companions or associates or people we know. But Krishna uses a, a very special word which indicates a very deep bond of affection. And that, that is very important also, that there should be a very deep feeling of love and affection between the devotee and Lord Krishna. So when these three points are applied specifically, the enjoyer of all of our penances and austerities, and when we recognize him as the proprietor of everything, and at the same time he's the best friend of everyone, then we can achieve peace. We can get what we would really want, peace. It's very important to get peace, because without peace there's no possibility of happiness. First you have to be peaceful, and then you can get happiness. Go on. Happiness is something higher than peace. So it's really important for us to understand how to achieve this kind of peace. This peace is 
it's more than just simply peace of mind. You know, the mind, how long will the mind be peaceful for? Our mind is very restless and agitated. The mind easily gets disturbed. Arjuna, when Arjuna was asked by Lord Krishna to do meditation, Arjuna said he couldn't do it. In the chapter 6, which is the next chapter from the one I'm reading just now, in chapter 6, uh, Lord Krishna was describing about meditation to Arjuna. And Arjuna said, Oh, chanchalahi mano buddhir. My mind is more restless than the wind, very difficult to control. So that was Arjuna's mind, and Arjuna is so much of a, he's a much greater personality than I am. I don't know about all of you, but I know he's, wow, he's far, far much greater than I am. I can't begin to compare to him. So if he can't control his mind, I know what is my position. So we have to learn how to fix the mind to get peace. If you want to have peace, we have to learn how to see everything in the proper light. The tendency is in a material life, we think, I am, instead of thinking of Krishna as being the best friend, and instead of thinking of Krishna as being the proprietor, and instead of thinking that Krishna is the enjoyer of penances and austerities, we want to take Krishna's position. We like to put ourselves into Krishna's position. And we think, I am the best friend of everyone. And we think, I am the proprietor, I am the enjoyer. This is the diseased mentality, or we could simply call it as conditioning, that we become conditioned by the material energy, and we forget our actual position. We forget, first of all, who we are. We identify with the body and the mind and the senses. And we, we want to create an empire for ourselves, and we try to endeavor to acquire more and more and to exploit and to enjoy this world independently of the Supreme Lord Krishna. So that is a big problem. When we declare our independence from Krishna, then we're really going to asking for trouble. We want to get peace you have to recognize our relationship with the Supreme Lord. We all have a relationship. So it's, it's very important for us to try to apply this formula in our daily life. And it's very appropriate that I'm speaking on this verse today because, of course, we all know that on Tuesday is the Ekadasi, and this particular ekadasi, which comes on Tuesday, is the day in which Lord Krishna spoke the Bhagavad Gita. So Lord Krishna spoke the Bhagavad Gita most recently. Most recently he spoke it was 5,000 years ago at Kurukshetra. But the Lord has spoken this knowledge many times and in many different places. And actually he's speaking that knowledge right now in some other universe, which we are not aware of, but it's eternal knowledge. So this peace formula is also part of this eternal knowledge. And if we apply this formula in our daily life, we will see how our life can improve. We are so unfortunate that we live in the illusion of materialism. We are thinking, first of all, I am the body, and we think, because I am the body, I have senses, and my goal of life is to enjoy my senses. I have to satisfy my senses. Of course, that's the big illusion. We cannot satisfy the senses, and we, but we try. We try to enjoy. We try to enjoy this body. We try to get pleasure 
where there actually is no pleasure. Just like you go in a desert and sometimes in the desert you may be anxious for water and you imagine there's water up ahead. You imagine there's a, an oasis and there's water up there, but there's no water. It's just an illusion. So we suffer from these illusions. In the same way we suffer illusions in our life, in this material world. The illusion is, I am the best friend of everyone. I am the proprietor. I am the enjoyer. And this is all described in the 16th chapter of Bhagavad Gita, where Krishna mentions this is the Asuric mentality. Right? The 16th chapter is the divine and the demoniac nature. There are two natures. There is the nature of the godly person or the, the sura, or we could say the devotee. And then there's the asura or the demons or those who are atheistic and non-devotees. There's just these two classes of people. And Lord Krishna goes into some detail to describe the demonic mentality. Particularly, he says, Ishwaraham aham bogi sidoham balavam suki. This is the description of the demon, right? Ishwaraham, he's thinking, I am the controller. He's not thinking, I am the servant. Actually, we are. We're all servants. We're tiny servants. We're not even directly the servant but we're the servant many times removed of the servant from the Supreme Lord. To directly serve the Supreme Lord, you have to be very expert, very qualified. But we can be the servant of the servant of the servant of the servant, many times the servant. Right? In that way, we begin to purify ourselves and become more qualified to serve the Lord. A devotee should not be too much anxious to directly come to Krishna, but rather we have to attract Krishna by our service. Srila Prabhupada's spiritual teacher used to tell the devotees, don't try to see God, but act in such a way that God will come to see you. So the idea is that if we do our service very nicely, if we do everything we're supposed to do in the proper manner, in the proper mood, Krishna will be so pleased with us, he'll come to see us. He'll want to thank us for our service. Of course, we don't like to trouble Krishna, but we just want to give some humble service to Krishna. Devotional service has to be uh, performed without any selfishness. Rather, the mood should be selfless. We should want to serve Krishna without any thought of remuneration. In other words, we shouldn't expect to be paid for serving Krishna. We should be happy to give service to Krishna. We want to offer everything for the pleasure of Krishna. So a devotee will give his time and energy, he will use his bodily strength and his words all for the satisfaction of Lord Krishna. He's not thinking about, him, about his own self, about his own position, he just wants to please Krishna, to give to Krishna. There are two kinds of souls. There are conditioned souls and liberated souls. The conditioned souls, they want to be the enjoyers, right? I, I was telling you the demonic mentality, Ishwara Hum. I am the controller, Aham Bogi. I am the enjoyer. Siddho Hum. I am perfect. Balavam Suki. Bala, I am strong. And Suki, I am happy. So this is the ignorance of the conditioned soul. He's thinking, I'm strong. How strong can you be? 
One day the body will age and become weak. You're happy? How long are you happy for? Is your happiness eternal? Unlikely. We know the nature of happiness, it comes and goes, like the winter and summer seasons. There's happiness and distress. It comes and it goes. We have to just simply learn to live with the good and the bad. So Krishna Consciousness is teaching us a philosophy which is very practical. Now, uh, as I said, Tuesday is the day Krishna spoke the Bhagavad Gita, and it's a very good day to uh, invite people to read the Bhagavad Gita. And you can tell them this book is 5,000 years old, and it was spoken 5,000 years ago on this particular day. And in this way you may be able to attract people to take a, a little time to hear the Bhagavad Gita or to read it with you. As devotees we do try to read the Bhagavad Gita, especially that particular day in which Krishna spoke the Bhagavad Gita. And we want to understand how practical and how valuable the knowledge of the Bhagavad Gita is. Just like this formula for peace which is given here. It's a very basic, simple formula, but it's very practical and very valuable. And if we, we can easily apply it into our life, we simply have to, first of all, we have to familiarize ourselves with Lord Krishna's words. That Lord Krishna is telling us, first of all, that He is the enjoyer of all of our sacrifices and penances. So sometimes we do uh, some tapasya, just like as devotees, of course, well, we do on a courtesy, we, we will fast from grains and beans that day. And then we have holy days also, like on Janmashtami, we will fast that day. And on the appearance of great avatars, we will, we will do some fasting, maybe half a day, maybe longer. Gaur Purnima, we'll fast until moonrise. And Janmashtami, we fast until midnight. And Ram Nomi, we also fast. Nishringa, the appearance day of Lord Nishringa Dev is a, another fasting until the, the, uh, when the sun goes down, sunset. So the, these are austerities, that's some tapasya, controlling the tongue, going without food, and on the courtesy, restricting how much we eat, not eating heavy food like grains and rice. So that's an austerity. And, but we should understand we're doing this austerity for Lord Krishna. We don't do it for our own self but we do it for the pleasure of Krishna. A devotee wants to please Krishna. So, we do, when we do chanting, we do our, our chanting should be done for the pleasure of Krishna. Then we do our uh, our worship, our yagna, or maybe, maybe of course, Kali Yuga, we, the, proper, the real yagna in the Kali Yuga is Sankirtan. Harinam Sankirtan is the, the yagna prescribed for the Kali Yuga. And we should do that also for the pleasure of Lord Krishna. We have to remember this line from the Bhagavad Gita, Bhokta Ram Yagna Tapasham, the enjoyer of our penances and austerities is meant to be Lord Krishna. We do these things for his pleasure. And certainly he's pleased when he sees the devotees go for Sankirtan, when he sees the devotees observe fasting on the holy days, He's pleased with them. He sees the devotees making some efforts to control their mind and senses. He's pleased and he blesses them with spiritual advancement. 
and that spiritual advancement means fr relief from material anxiety, relief from all the desires which come in the material life. People are always troubled with so many desires, unlimited desires, but we will become freed from these things, we will become peaceful when we perform this yagna, this sacrifice, doing the yagna for Krishna's pleasure, and then remember then we have to remember that Krishna is the proprietor also. Everything is His. Nothing is actually mine. Nothing belongs to me. You're, you, we, we think my home, my husband, my children, my money, like this, my body. Nothing is actually ours. Even our own body doesn't belong to us. The body is given to us by the grace of Krishna. We have to learn to use it properly in the service of Krishna. And when we do that, that is very pleasing to Krishna. And Krishna will bless us with peace of mind, spiritual advancement. Peace of mind meaning relief from material desires relief from all the attachments of material life. People want peace. So peace is not just, they generally we'll say peace and quiet. <laughs> peace and quiet. You want to get away from the noise and the hustle and all the trouble. So maybe so many families there, and different relatives and or customers or whatever and you want to get you want to enjoy peace and quiet so peace is what is described here in the Bhagavad Gita Lord Krishna is giving us this very simple formula remember three things we perform our yagna and tapasyas for his pleasure that he is the proprietor, everything belongs to him. There's a common saying, you know, uh, in India we have a common saying, we say, Kali hath ayate, Kali hath chalo. Or in Hindi they will say, uh, well that's Hindi of course, in English we would say, we come to this world empty-handed and we will leave this world empty-handed. Nothing is actually ours. We are not the proprietor. Nothing really belongs to us. Although people work hard and they acquire things and they think this is mine, and, but actually we can't take anything with us when we leave the world, when we give up our bodies. We cannot take anything with us. So it's good for us to be, develop that detachment while we're in the world. And it will make it easier for us when we have to leave the world. If we don't develop that detachment, when it comes time for us to leave the world, it will be very difficult. And we see, for, we see examples of renunciation, great souls like in Srimad Bhagavatam, Maharaj Parikshit. Maharaj Parikshit was the grandson of Arjun. He was actually the seminal son of Abhimanu born, conceived in the womb of Abhimanu's wife Uttara. And Maharaj Parikshit became the ruler. After the Pandavas retired, he ruled the world. So Maharaj Parikshit, however, was cursed. And he, had, he was cursed that he would die within seven days. So he had to prepare for his death. So he immediately left all of his wealth. He gave up everything, his kingdom, and he left his family and he left all of the position and the responsibilities. He had to give up everything and he went to prepare for death because he knew the death curse could not be avoided. So how to prepare for that death? He gave up everything. He took off his royal robes and put on very simple cloth and then he went to find people who were 
renounced from the material world. He went to a holy place to seek out people there who could guide him and help him to prepare for leaving the body. So one of the things which is required in preparing for leaving the body is to give up everything, let go of everything. Don't try to hold on to things because nothing is actually ours. We are given maybe temporary custody of things for a little while. We have things for a little time, but they're not, they're not ours eternally. We didn't come to this world with anything, and when we leave this body, we cannot take anything with us. We have to recognize everything that we have is actually Lord Krishna's. It belongs to God, and it's meant to be used for His service. So he is the real proprietor. As I said, even this body is given to us by the grace of God. We're meant to use it for his service. Just like you, have a, you may have an apartment, it may not be yours. Maybe you didn't purchase it, you're just renting it. So you have to pay rent to the landlord. So in a similar manner, we're renting our body, and we're renting all the facilities which come along with this body. They're all provided for us by the grace of the Supreme Lord. And we're meant to satisfy Him by using them in the appropriate manner. And we're meant to also, maybe you could say, just like you have a landlord, you have to pay rent. And so we should pay rent also for the facilities which are given to us by the Supreme Lord. And we pay rent by, not by just simply giving money, but by performing acts of devotion for His pleasure. Of course, one of these, ple one of these acts of devotion could be contributing financially to the temple, giving a donation to help support the temple and to maintain the worship of the temple. So that's very pleasing to the Lord. That is also like our tax, you know, Krishna tax. We have to pay, pay for the facilities which are given to us by the Lord. And we have obligations, we have debts. We have to meet them as we perform these things for His pleasure. But we, we do it with pleasure. We don't do it grudgingly. Because remember, the Supreme Lord is our very dear friend. Sarva Bhuta Maheshwaram uh, Suridam Sarva Bhutanam Suridam Sarva Bhutanam The best friend, he's our, our best friend. We're not the best friend, but he is the best friend of everyone. And he's our best friend. So we should, we should consider ourselves very, very fortunate that we have such a nice friend in Lord Krishna. How fortunate we are that we have a friend who is so wealthy, we have a friend who is so famous, we have a friend who is so strong, we have a friend who is so good-looking, we have a friend who is so knowledgeable, and we have a friend who is so renounced. He's not attached to these things. Somebody may say, oh, this Lord Krishna, he is boasting so much. He is saying everything is his, everything has got to be done for his pleasure. Why should we do it for him? Well, we have to understand this is his position. He, he's God. You have to understand he's not an ordinary person. We are ordinary living entities, we are tiny living entities in comparison to Him. But He is the Supreme Lord, eternally. As we were reading in the purport, even Lord Shiva and Lord Brahma, they are subordinate to Lord Krishna, and they bow down to Lord Krishna. Uh, Lord Brahma, He tried to steal away the cows and the cowherd boys and Lord Krishna had to take their place. And Lord Brahma stole the cows and the cowherd boy away for a moment of his time. 
but that one moment of his time turned out to be one year on this planet. And for one year, Lord Krishna was taking the place of all the cows and all the cowherd boys. And Lord Shiva, he wanted to understand the power of Krishna's maya. So Lord Krishna arranged to produce a form of Mohini Murti. Mohini Murti was the form of the most beautiful woman. And when Lord Shiva saw her, he became infatuated and he raced after her. And wherever she, she went, Lord Shiva was racing, trying to catch her, trying to grab her. She was actually Mohini Murti. She was the, the fe feminine form of the Supreme Lord. Lord Krishna can appear sometimes also as a woman. And Lord Shiva was so attracted to this Mohini Murti. And Lord Mohini Murti even led him around the places where the great sages were all sitting meditating. And the great sages could see Lord Shiva chasing after this woman. So this was how Lord Shiva was bewildered by Lord Krishna. Another time, Lord Krishna came because Lord Krishna's grandson, Aniruddha, had been arrested by a demon called Banasura. So Lord Krishna came with his army and there was a great fight between the army of Lord Krishna and the army of Banasura. And this Banasura was a great devotee of Lord Shiva. So Lord Shiva had promised he would always reside there at Banu's place and if anybody, if there was any enemies, anybody came to attack, he would fight against them. So Lord Shiva was fighting against Lord Krishna <laughs> and it was a great battle. But Lord Krishna defeated Lord Shiva. And so even though Lord Shiva is very great, very powerful, he cannot defeat Lord Krishna. So he, Lord Shiva is actually a Vaishnava. We say Vaishnavam Yata Shambhu, that Lord Shiva is the greatest Vaishnava, that he offers his respects to Lord Krishna. Sometimes we will even chant the mantra, we will chant a mantra which goes, Brahma Bolo Chatur Mukhi Krishna Krishna Hare Hare Mahadevo Panchamukhi Rama Rama Hare Hare So the meaning is that the four faces of Lord Brahma, they're all chanting the names Krishna Krishna Hare Hare and the five faces of Lord Shiva, they're chanting the names Rama, Rama, Hari, Hari. So in this way, you can understand the, the supreme position of Lord Krishna over even powerful demigods like Lord Brahma and Lord Shiva. So we shouldn't mind to offer our full respects to Lord Krishna. And we should feel very grateful that he is our best friend that he cares so much about us, that he cared so much about us that he came into this world, he comes in different avatars, all for the purpose of teaching us and enlightening us. Sometimes he comes to reduce the burden on the world and sometimes he comes to teach and to say, to give, to give his mercy. <laughs> He comes to give mercy to all of us devotees. He cares about us. Sometimes he comes himself and sometimes he sends his pure devotees into this world. So we should all feel very much attached to Lord Krishna. We should feel so fortunate that he is such a great personality, but at the same time, he is our very, very dear friend. So, I want to remind all of you about Tuesday, that Tuesday is the day in which Lord Krishna spoke, the Gita Jayanti. It's the day in which Krishna spoke the Bhagavad Gita. We should all be reading the Bhagavad Gita on Tuesday and try also to distribute some Bhagavad Gitas to introduce to your friends or to invite some of your friends to come 
and to sit and read the Bhagavad Gita together. It's a very, very good opportunity. It's an auspicious day. So we want to take advantage of these auspicious days to distribute Krishna consciousness, to give the message of Krishna. The more you give the mercy, the more you get the mercy. So I fall at your feet and I beg all of you, you please, you know, try to do this. Try to make some nice arrangement for remembering Lord Krishna more. Of course, Ekadasi is already a very special day. It's a holy day, a day which is very dear to Lord Krishna. And this particular Ekadasi is especially dear because Lord Krishna chose to speak Bhagavad Gita that day. All right, so we will stop now and we will ask if there are any questions or comments from anyone. Yes, some hands are up there. Let me see who is it. Ram Sudarshan Das Prabhu. Oh, Sudarshan Prabhu is there, yes. Yeah. Hare Krishna Prabhu. Can please accept my humble obeisances, Guru Maharaj. Please accept uh, my obeisances. Guru Maharaj, uh, okay, I have a few questions. Maybe I'll ask one of it first. Um, so you were saying that uh, this particular verse on uh, Shanti and Brichiti, just like to know, uh, at what level uh, do devotees experience this Shanti Mrichiti? Is it like in a Nishta platform or is it something which is experienced by Uttama Adhikaris? Maybe you can, uh, yeah, this is my first question, Guru Maharaj. Yes, well, there are different levels of peace. It could be at the level of Uttama Adhikari, but it could also be very neophyte devotee, that they feel peace of mind. We know that per performing performance of devotional service, uh, that one of the characteristics of performing devotional service is it gives immediate relief from all types of material distress. So this is mentioned in Nectar of Devotion. You know, we're talking about Vaidhi Bhakti according to rules and regulations. So relief from all kinds of material distress. Yes, you should really come up to higher levels and uh, you would expect maybe that nishta, something of nishta. But even though one is not up to nishta, one could still also experience some relief from the stress of materialistic life and feel the, some level of peace. Thank you, Guru Maharaj. So in that case, uh, can we also say like uh, there is temporary uh, peace which is experienced and there is also permanent peace which is experienced. And the permanent peace that is mentioned here, can we also say it's like the symptoms of the Sthita Prajna which is discussed in Chapter 2? Oh, yes, well. Mm -mm. Temporary peace. Of course, it's going to depend on their, their level, their absorption in devotional service. If, it's, if they keep up their devotional service, then the peace can be, the peace will continue. But if they deviate, if they go back again into materialistic life and forget Krishna and give up their prank, then the peace will be forgotten, will, be, will drift away, will become lost. So, uh, the Sthita Pragna person, he restrains the senses. He's able to restrain the senses fixed in the self. It's not, that's quite an advanced level, actually, to come to that Sthita Pragna stage. Of course, somebody who's on that stage, Sthita, that they can restrain their senses then they will certainly, uh, they should, there should be some peace, but even though, they're, even though they're restraining the senses, it might be some mechanical re repression, that they're still within the mind, there still may be the desire for sense gratification. 
so the mind may not be peaceful. You see, without devotion, you're not going to get peace. There has to be some attraction for the Supreme Lord. It's really with the bhakti that you're going to get the peace. If there's no devotion there, you're not going to get it. So just to, the sthita pragna, he may be the yogi and he's restraining the senses, but he may have no devotion. So he won't get much peace. Okay, thank you Guru Maharaj. Just one more question from me. Um, is nothing out of the topic, but just uh, generally I hear people, devotees say that the golden age has begun, is going to begin and everything. They're going to experience a 10,000 years of golden age. So I, I've heard some devotees say that it's actually started with Dr. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Some people are saying it started after Prabhupada came or after ISKCON was established. And some people are saying it's yet to come. Uh, what is your take in this, Guru Maharaj? Just like to know. Mm. Uh, well, I don't know where the reference is, but we do hear it, yeah. We do hear that there's a golden age and it's in this Kali Yuga. And it's, you know, I think it, I understood it was from the time of Lord Chaitanya. And it would go on for 10,000 years. Okay. Thank you, Guru Maharaj. Hmm. Hare Krishna. Thank you for the questions. So, anybody else is there with questions there? Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes. Hare Krishna Prabhu. Uh, Maharaj, I uh, have a question uh, which I've read the letter. Prabhupada sent for a uh, devotee by name uh, Sachi, a uh, Prabhupada disciple. Here I, I read that the Prabhupada mentioned that one should not became engaged, become engaged in frivolous sports. So could Maharaj elaborate what is exactly like Prabhupada meant frivolous sports? Yeah, frivolous sports. Uh, frivolous sports means, well, things which are you know, not, they're not Krishna conscious, you know, playing cricket and football, golf, these things, you know, this is just waste of time and energy. Vedic, there are some Vedic sports, the Vedic sports are things like uh, swimming and wrestling. Th those two things were somewhat Vedic you know, swimming and wrestling. But these ball games, they're not really, they're not really Vedic. So frivolous sports, sports which have no real meaning, no purpose to them. Um, Maharaj, did Sila Prabhupada mention any uh, uh, kind of uh, physical activities for devotees to perform? Yes. Kirtan, dancing in the kirtan, that was what Prabhupada thought was a good exercise for the devotees. He said, dancing in the kirtan and go for book distribution. These things, you use up your energy in these ways, you get a lot of purification. Thank you, Manas. One morning, Prabhupada was on a morning walk, he saw someone do yoga and he said, he saw the man doing yoga and Prabhupada said, oh yes, he said, very good for health. And then the devotees were looking, they're thinking, oh, Prabhupada, should we do yoga? And Prabhupada said, no, not required. <laughs> not required. So Prabhupada didn't encourage these things. He wanted us to just use our energy in preaching and distributing books, kirtan. That's, that way you get purification and, and you're serving Krishna. It's, it's, in Krishna. it's all in Krishna consciousness. Mm -hmm. okay. okay, Manish. Thank you, Manish. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna Guru Maharaj, there is one question in the chat box by His Grace Anand Kumar Das Prabhu. Hare Krishna Guru Maharaj, Dandava Pranams, all glories to Sri Prabhupada. May I know 
Is the chanting of Maha Mantra the only way to become closer to Krishna? Please enlighten me. Thank you very much, Hare Krishna. Well, certainly it's a very effective means to come closer to Krishna. In the Kali Yuga, Lord Chaitanya said that there's no other way, there's no other way, no other way but the chanting of the holy name. So Lord Chaitanya didn't just only chant Hare Krishna, although that was it, that's certainly the most powerful of the, all the mantras, but we know Lord Chaitanya went through Jarakanda forest and he chanted, he chanted uh, Krishna, 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 hey. And that song is there. And then Prabhupada also writes that there's another Maha Mantra as well. And it, uh, Prabhupada in the Bhagavatam Purpur or Chaitanya Charitamrita Purpur rather, he's written about another Maha Mantra which is Hare Harai Nama Krishna Yadavai Namaha Gopal Govinda Ram Sri Madhusudan. And he said, this song was a great favorite of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And he said, this song should be included, as particularly in Mayapur, it should be sung, but everywhere it can be sung. And he said, this is also like Maha Mantra. He called it also a Maha Mantra, just like Hare Krishna Mantra. So you want to be close to Krishna. We don't usually go directly to Krishna, but we go to Krishna through his devotees. So you want to be close to Krishna, so get close to Krishna's devotees and associate with the devotees and serve the devotees and be with the devotees in the association of devotees. And in this way you will come close to Krishna. Yes? Is it clear? <laughs> I hope so. Okay, Sri Devi, is Sri Devi Maharaji, is there any other questions here? Hare Krishna, can you hear me? Oh, sorry, Hare Krishna, Guru Maharaj, I was mute, sorry. Guru Maharaj, I wanted to ask the question. Uh, many of us, uh, many of us, I speak for myself, that people like me, we are, I mean, I, I come from a family where not, not everybody is a devotee, I'm the only devotee, sole devotee in the house. So I'm still uh, embroiled and entangled in many of the matters of the home. So even though I want to be peaceful, I want to be detached and all that, but because I'm part of the family, I'm also involved in so many things that other people are involved in. So um, how do I extricate myself? How do I just extinguish this? You know, do I have to wait another 10 more years, 5 more years, and then I'll become peaceful? or? Could you please give me some advice, Guru Maharaj? I pray to the dust of your lotus feet to follow the, the Tuesday Bhagavad Gita, uh, introducing Bhagavad Gita to, to some friends. Yes, well, certainly, you know, now you're retired from your academic duties and you're more at home. And so that maybe there's a tendency that the, the family are looking more to you to do more at home. But you should be careful about that. You should be cautious about taking on more responsibilities at home. That you want to try to keep aloof from these things. That actually you've retired and you should take up more your spiritual duties rather than material duties. Your children are grown up. They can take care of themselves. They're perfectly capable of looking after themselves. You don't really have to worry about them. You know, so you really do want to focus. You know, we, we, in fact, the Vedic culture is like that. We say from the age of 50, you know, you have to prepare for the next life. Right? So, because it takes time to get detached. And you have a lot. You know, you have four children and you have, and you have a home, a nice home and a husband and so you have a lot of things to be attached to. And your education, you know, you did a PhD and so many degrees and things. You've done so many things so you can have, a, you have a lot of attachments in the material world and you have to try to purify these things with Krishna consciousness. You have to you have to understand these things are all 
They're temporary, you know, they're finished with the body. And you have to really cultivate your attachment for Krishna. And of course you do it, you have your deities, you have your temple, and so you want to uh, do your chanting and so on. And uh, when you can, go to the temple and try to organize also things like you're doing online, you know, you get try to get people together to read with you if you okay. if you can on a, even the one of the ladies I know she does it on a daily basis so oh. maybe if you can get people every day to spend time a half an hour or so to read Srimad Bhagavatam with you okay that, should it be online Guru Maharaj or should it be in person Guru Maharaj? Well, of course, in person is the best, but if you can't get in person, then online is better than nothing. Should it be a devotee or, or not a devotee Guru Maharaj? It doesn't have to be a devotee, they just have to be willing to read with you. Oh, okay. And if they read Bhagavatam with you, then they'll gradually become devotees. Oh, I see. Okay. Thank you so much, Guru Maharaj. Thank you so much. Uh, there's one last question uh, in the chat. Um, uh, by um, Veda Priya Mataji. How much should we accumulate since we do not know when we will leave our body? How to discharge from material activity? Not knowing how much is still needed to maintain the body. Yes. Well, the point is you want to minimize the demands of the body. You don't want to wait for the time of death. You can't do that. You can't just wait until, you can't think, well, I'm, you know, I'm still working, I haven't retired yet, after I retire then. No, we have to minimize the demands of the body now. At every, you don't want to be act, act unnecessarily increasing the demands of the body, accumulating more and more, and having more and more uh, different comforts and things around us. We want to really try to simplify our life. Right? Prabhupada used to say, simple living and high thinking. So we, we want to try to simplify our way of living. Uh, just, you know, be careful about over collecting. That's something which we discuss. Maybe if you study the nectar of instruction, they talk about atyahara. It means overeating or over collecting. So just like we don't want to overeat, we also don't want to over collect. And we do have that tendency because we're very much of a consumer orientated society. Our, our civil, the culture these days is very much consumer-minded and we accumulate a lot. We collect so many books, we collect so many, you know, gadgets and so many clothes and so many shoes and we collect and, you know, it just goes on and on endlessly and we have so many things. So we have to always try to minimize, you try to simplify and cut down and keep it simple. Hmm? One devotee said, he said, keep it simple. He calls it the KISS formula. KISS. Keep it simple, stupid. <laughs> right? KISS. K-I-S-S. -S. Keep it simple, stupid. <laughs> so we want to keep our life simple because we are stupid and we do have that tendency. We accumulate and you know, people give you things, so you have to, when people give you things, then you have to pass them off, you have to give them to other people, you know. Don't just keep them sitting around, don't just get attached, you know, try to minimize, try to keep it basic. That will help a lot. So for the service of Krishna, we need things, but for our own self, we want to minimize. Okay, so thank you very much. Thank you very much Guru Maharaj for an amazing class and for giving us so much realization. I think our temple president, His Grace Tulsi Prana Prabhu would like to uh, 
uh, also thank Guru Maharaj. Mataji, there's one more question in the chat. Okay, this is the last question. Just now I mentioned it, this last question. And uh, okay, so uh, is Guru Maharaj okay to accept one last question, okay. Guru Maharaj? Okay. Hare Krishna Maharaj, may I know at which level should I approach a spiritual master to inquire submissively? Because right now, due to current pandemic and also technology, online classes and Srila Prabhupada's books are available to obtain knowledge of the absolute truth. So the question, what's the question? At, at which level should I approach a spiritual master to inquire submissively? Well, at what level? You know, you, you need to get initiation, that's important. So when you're qualified, you know, in order to understand more about the initiation process, you should complete the disciple course. So I'm not sure about what's happening in Malaysia, but the disciple course is very important and it should be going on regularly. And I think and if, if you don't do it from Malaysia, you can contact Vrindavan or you can contact Mayapur or you can contact Radhadesh or there's many different centers around the world where they are doing the disciple course. And it's, it's uh, very helpful to you to understand about the initiation process and when you, when you first of all you want to initiate you have to be qualified. You have to be following four principles and chanting 16 rounds daily and you have to also have association and guidance from devotees. You have to be in touch with devotees. So you really need to do this ISKCON Disciple Course. They call it IDC, ISKCON Disciple Course. And once you do that, then you get all the information you need about initiation. Hare Krishna. Okay, so the temple president is there. He wants to talk to me. Is it? Or... Prabhu, Tulsi Pana, Prabhu, are you there, Prabhu? Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna, Prabhu. No, okay. That's... Hare Krishna. Oh, okay. Hare Krishna, Maharaj. Hare Krishna, Prabhu. Hare Krishna. Thank you very, very much, for Maharaj, for a wonderful class. Okay. Uh, we are waiting for eagerly for your next class. So, uh, Hare Krishna, Maharaj. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna, Prabhu. Thank you for having me. It was a pleasure. You are most welcome, Maharaj. Good luck with the preaching there. I hope everything yeah. goes well. We are trying our very best, Maharaj. Because uh, still uh, the turnout is not so good, but we are trying our best. Okay, Prabhu, thank you. Hare right. Krishna, Srila Prabhupada Ki. Jai. Gaur Bhakti Vrinda Ki. Jai.